Well, let me just uh, uh, start off by saying I think I'm going to give you a, a, a different view of climate from a very uh, fine scale on topoclimatic variability and thinking about seed collection strategies. And it's a real honor and privilege to be part of this symposium. Okay, next slide. So, you know, as we've been hearing, and as we all know, uh, plant adaptations of climate are really pervasive. It's the basis of seed zones, uh, frost, heat, and drought tolerance, phenology. There's adaptations at the enzymatic level where different alleles have different temperature optimum. There's adaptations at a morphological level like root to shoot ratios. Uh, and climatic selection is very strong and can overcome short distance gene flow, which means we get very fine scale genetic mosaics where we bothered to look. And so capturing a range of climate ad adaptations is essential when developing uh, seed stock that needs to be spread in complex terrain across multiple sites. So, so we get the right climate adaptations in the right spot. Next slide. So by climate, uh, we have to define what scale we're looking at. Uh, the macro climate is this global circulation and the synoptic meteorology, and it's like the difference between Northern California and Southern California. The mesoclimate is where we're looking at things like coastal inland gradients, elevation gradients, rain shadows, and this is the scale at which seed zones are really laid out. It's the topo climate where we get to the fine scale terrain uh, factors like uh, solar radiation on north versus south slopes, relative elevation and frost pockets. And finally, we get down to the true microclimate, which is the vegetation canopies and um, other fine scale surface features. Next. So I'm going to be really concentrating on the topo climate. So we're first going to go to the Pepperwood Preserve in Sonoma County. It's about 3,300 acres. Next. And we laid out uh, an array of these little hobos, uh, small temperature sensors across the preserve on north slopes and south slopes, canyon bottoms and ridge tops and mid slopes. And uh, when you look at this graph, you can see there's a lot of temperature variability, uh, minimum daily temperature. So that the, uh, the black line, uh, hit the next slide. Yeah, keep that. Uh, the black line is the weather station up at the top of the preserve. Um, so you might say, oh, that's the climate of Pepperwood. But if we look at this finer scale, we see there's a huge amount of variability. Next slide. And so this is the temperature range of T min that we see across the preserve. So on some nights, it's greater than 15 degrees Celsius. A lot of times it's greater than 10 degrees Celsius. So uh, we really need to think about this type of variability. Uh, next slide. So we can model it. Um, we take the empirical data, then we pick a time period in, the square, in that square, which is uh, December, January, February, typical winter T min. Uh, do some statistical modeling using terrain features, uh, using terrain features um, like topographic position and aspect, and we can come up with a map like this with a GIS projection with a little bit of multivariate voodoo. And this is a pretty good map showing uh, the blue areas are the cold canyon bottoms and the red areas are the warm ridge tops. Um, you know, and it's about a 10 degree C range across this uh, terrain. Next slide. And we can convert that into an easily uh, understood uh, factor freeze hours. So the, on the left is the relationship between the average winter minimum temperature and the number of hours uh, you were below zero degree C. So the coldest spot had nearly a thousand hours. And the warmest spot had less than 10. And this is all within a 3,300 acre preserve. And then we can make a map of that. 
So that just demonstrates there's a lot of climatic variability at the topoclimatic scale. Next slide. Uh, now we're going to go up to the uh, White Mountains in uh, the Crooked Creek Station. Uh, next slide. A beautiful subalpine valley. We laid out some temperature sensors and transects going up different aspects up to almost the ridge tops. Uh, next slide. And these are the kind of results we got where you see the spaghetti diagram. I mean, it's organized spaghetti. So uh, at dawn, there's about an eight degree Celsius uh, difference in average hourly temperature within this single square kilometer. And then about the same range in the middle of the day. So, um, and it's consistent from site to site. So next slide. We can build another T-min model. So this is showing what uh, you know, our projection is across the landscape with cold, cold valley floors and warmer ridge tops and steep slopes. Uh, next slide. And when you look at it, uh, it turns out there's no correlation between T-max and T-min at this scale, i.e. we have about an eight degree Celsius gradient in T-max and about an eight degree Celsius uh, gradient in T-min, and there's no correlation between them. So you can get almost any combination of these two factors in a really small area. Next slide. So let's say we're trying to develop seed stock for revegetating sagebrush, and we want to make sure we get a wide range of climatic adaptation in this very widespread species. Next slide. So, uh, so we know the factors that drive the temperature difference. So north facing to south facing slopes for T max and topographic position, you're below the surrounding terrain or you're above the surrounding terrain. Next slide. So what we can do is just make sure that our seed collection is is stratified across these gradients because then we'll be getting all of the possible combinations of, uh, of site conditions and the presumed adaptations of the plants to those. Next slide. Uh, so that when we go into a terrain like this, uh, you know, we have an idea about how to come up with a well stratified sample. So we are getting the uh, variability within this complex terrain. Next slide. Okay, now we're going to go to serpentine grassland where we're um, going to look at uh, the effects of slope and aspect and solar radiation. Uh, next slide. So this are some measurements with an infrared thermometer uh, in 1992. Uh, the the x-axis on all these gra graphs is from a south facing 30 degree slope to a north facing 30 degree slope. And we can see on November 11th, we had a gradient from 40 degrees at noon, this is all done at noon, to uh, about 10 degrees on the north facing 30 degree slope while the air temperature was about 17. Same thing, patterns carry out throughout the year on December 16th, about 30 degrees on the south facing slope, and it's close to freezing on the north 30 degree slope because uh, that slope, that north slope is in deep shade at this time of the year and never warms up. And this is the environment in which plants are germinating. So it's just, you know, you're going to have a hard time if you're adapted to the south facing slope of being over on the north facing slope. And these are very strong uh, and consistent gradients. Next slide. And they express themselves in the phenology of the plants. So this is from a 1988 paper, I forgot to put the reference on, but showing the flowering curves of Lastenia um, on the south fa southwest facing slopes, the flat and the north facing slopes. And if you want to get, say, an early flowering genotype, you're not going to go to the southwest facing slope and say this is the south face, this is the early genotype. What you need to do 
is select the phenology within the topoclimates, not between the topoclimates, because the effect of this of the radiation environment is an environmental factor that's leading to different temperature accumulations. So keep that in mind. So um, I think the point here is there's a lot of hidden genetic variability in complex terrain that we're never going to get the um, explicit, but we can account for it by um, sampling across uh, well-known and uh, documented topoclimatic gradients. Uh, thank you. No uh, question and answer for Stu. I used up my 10 minutes. I see. Got it. Okay. There very are good. any questions in the Q&A, so. Okay. Very yeah. good. All right. Okay. Thanks so much. Uh, yeah. Good afternoon. I'm Pat Reynolds, and I'm the general manager of Hedgerow Farms, and I look forward to talking to you a little bit about how we produce seed of known genetic origin for habitat restoration projects. Uh, next slide. So Hedgerow Farms uh, was founded in the 1980s by John Anderson. Um, many of you may have heard that John Anderson passed away this year. Uh, may he rest in peace. Um, but John left a legacy uh, for all of us to enjoy with the setup of Hedgerow Farms where we're able to produce uh, so many thousands of pounds of seed of known genetic origin for habitat restoration projects. And today Hedgerow Farms has about 350 acres in production. Uh, the farm has around 100 acres of habitat uh, surrounding and bisecting the farm. Uh, we right now grow out more than 120 different species and also um, have many different ecotypes and with, within at least the, the workhorse species. We have a native uh, plug nursery and we sell our certified native grass straw. Uh, next slide. So, um, so producing seed of known genetic origin starts out with a collection of wildland seed. Uh, and that actually is one of the main limiting factors when it comes to uh, um, producing this seed. It's, it can be very difficult uh, to be able to locate sites uh, to collect the seed uh, that has you know, abundant seed. Um, it can take permits to be able to um, get the seed. Uh, you wanna make sure of course that you use uh, you're properly identified the, the, uh, the species that, that are being used. Uh, we work with UC Davis for Barium quite a bit with that. You know, some of the seed for us, it comes originally through contract grows, you know, where folks are giving us the seed to grow out for increases for their specific projects. Um, sometimes we collect the seed ourselves and other times we use professional contract seed collectors uh, to gather the wildland seed. And then, um, so the, the collection site documentation is really important, uh, as you can imagine. Um, you know, uh, the most important thing, of course, is the, is the coordinate location. And like Stu talked about, um, things like aspect and elevation can certainly have a, 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 an influencing effect on the seed. So that's important to have. Um, having information on soils, associated veg vegetation, and other things can really make a difference as well. So at a minimum, you know, we try to get the coordinate location, but uh, whenever possible, um, you know, uh, getting additional data can help with uh, restoration projects. Uh, next slide. So, you know, um, so one of the things that we try to do is, is, is uh, maintain the local genetics to the extent possible in our agricultural settings here at Hedgerow Farms. Um, and so we go through a lot of best management practices in order to do that. Um, one of the things, uh, sort of the primary things we do is how we place the fields. If you look at that uh, aerial photo on the right hand side there, you can see all of those different colors. Um, each of those colors represents a different ecotype or a different species. So you can imagine what it takes to figure out how to lay this thing out, how to lay our fields out in order to maintain the genetic integrity um, of these sites of our, of our material that we're producing. So one of the things that we 
try to do is we try not to um, grow the same species within the same year if possible. So we use time, you know, as one of the primary considerations when growing that out. So that eliminates any potential cross contamination. Um, but you know, to, to be honest, uh, most of the time we don't have that uh, that luxury. So we have to use other measures uh, to try to minimize potential cross contamination. Um, that includes distance as the primary measure. You know, we try to maintain um, certain distances depending upon the species and their breeding systems um, uh, based on uh, available literature and information from the California Crop Improvement Association. Um, and with that, we take into consideration other things like prevailing winds, um, whether there's barriers that are present. Uh, hedgerow farms luckily is uh, uh, has hedgerows throughout the fields. Uh, those hedgerows uh, do a great job of capturing pollen and uh, altering the, the flight patterns of bees. So we use that uh, as part of our means of maintaining that, that local um, genetic integrity between ecotypes. Next slide. So planting uh, seed of known genetic origins usually starts uh, with planting seed uh, with a Truax seed drill uh, in the fall. Um, oftentimes though, we don't have enough seed available. So we have to take that seed, uh, grow that out into containers and then plant that into the ground. Um, takes about 25,000 um, plugs to, to fill a, uh, uh, an acre um, to give you a sense for the scale that it takes in order to produce um, uh, this kind of seed. Next slide. So harvesting is a really important part of the process. Um, uh, whenever possible, we use our uh, flail vac. It's a, it's, a, it's a stripper that's, you can see a picture on the, the bottom left there. It's a stripper that's uh, attached to a tractor. Uh, it gives us the ability to harvest the seed uh, on multiple passes. So you can actually capture the seed uh, during early, mid, and late. So you, get, you capture more of the Gen X when you use the uh, flail vac. Um, but a lot of times the, what we use, we end up using uh, as part of harvesting is called a swather, which is the picture on the on the bottom right there, uh, basically it just cuts the, uh, the plant material a few inches off the ground and puts that into a windrow. Next slide. And then in this picture, you can kind of see the swather on the upper left. It's cutting some Festuca microstachys. It's putting it back into a windrow. Uh, once that material has an opportunity to dry, it's then picked up by a combine. Next slide. Okay, um, so a lot of the seed though, um, you know, the, it ripens indeterminately. It, it doesn't ripen at the same time. And, and a lot of the material we can't uh, use the flail vac to harvest. And so what we do in that particular case is we have to actually harvest the material by hand. Uh, milkweed is kind of the classic example of that. Um, sometimes for, uh, some of our milkweed fields take more than a month uh, to harvest it. Um, it's folks uh, pulling pods off of plants. Um, you know, every two or three days, basically. And, and uh, it's a very labor intensive process, but that's what we need to do in order to be able to maximize the yields on these, on these fields. Next slide. So seed cleaning is an important uh, part of the process with uh, production of the seed. It starts actually with, uh, with the combine. Um, the combine is a remarkable piece of equipment that really does a great job of separating that seed from the chaff. Um, the combine, um, we, we take the material that's been harvested with the combine, we put that out in tarps, uh, let that dry out. And once it's sufficiently dry, uh, it gets moved into our cleaning mill. And if you kind of look at the picture on the upper right, um, that's, a, uh, that's the first piece of machine that we use to um, clean, the, clean the material. It uh, has a series of agitating screens that separate the seed from the chaff. If you look on the lower left, uh, that's called an indent. Um, it's a, a basically a cylinder that has uh, uh, different dimples on the inside and it separates seed by shape. And then if you look at the bottom right, uh, that's called a gravity table and that separates seed by weight. And with that, uh, it kind of separates the light seed from the heavy seed, right? Uh, the, oh, back to the old slide. Um, so um, with that, um, uh, you end up, uh, the light seed of course has lower germination and the, and the um, heavier seed has higher germination. But kind of one of the big things here is that uh, 
when you're growing out the seed, uh, each and every time you use a piece of equipment, it has to be thoroughly cleaned, right? We cannot uh, have contamination between ecotypes or uh, as part of the process. So for example, um, with that, uh, with our combine, it can take three guys two hours in order to clean out that combine. And that's just one piece of equipment in the process. So it's very labor intensive. Next slide. So kind of the good news uh, is that uh, nowadays there actually is quite a bit of seed of known genetic origin uh, in Northern and Central California that's available for habitat restoration. We have a really good website at Hedgerow Farms. It's got a sortable database in there. Um, with that database, you can sort by uh, county or by uh, species uh, to give you a pretty good sense of, of what's available. Uh, really a powerful tool uh, when you're trying to design for habitat restoration projects. You know, it also includes a, a map that shows the, the collection site locations, which is another handy tool to have available when you're trying to design habitat restoration projects. Uh, next slide. Um, we also have a native plug nursery, um, which is, a, which is a, a great tool to have. Uh, there are some species that uh, just simply don't do well from seed. You know, worm season grasses, carex and juncus, things like that. So those are species that we often recommend folks uh, plant as plugs as opposed to using as seed. Um, so it's another sort of great tool that we have. And our nursery operation includes um, strict Phytophthora BNPs, which of course is, is really important nowadays here um, with Phytophthora being such an issue in native plant nurseries. Next slide. And then, then finally, um, at Hedgerow Farms, we do a lot of uh, contract grow, uh, seed increase contract grows where folks um, really need that very local, local material for their projects. So they provide us the seed they've collected from the wild. And then we'll take that seed. And if we have enough seed, we grow it out uh, directly in the field. Uh, but if we don't have enough seed, uh, then we grow that out into containers. And then those containers go out uh, into the field. So well, I think that's it. Um, I don't know if I have any time left. Uh, for my recording, but um, um, if I do, I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, Pat, you do have a couple of minutes for questions. So um, one is from Stephanie. She asked, in addition to the site information, do you try to collect any information about the source population, such as area or number of individuals and or the individual plants that were collected from, so the number of phenology locations? So basically, what kind of information do you collect? about your source population? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, we don't uh, collect that, inf that much information about the, the number of the source population when we collect. Um, you know, a lot of times the material comes from others, from clients that give us the, the seed or, uh, or from uh, professional contract seed growers. So, you know, other than location, uh, soils, associated vegetation, uh, we don't collect too much additional information um, beyond that. Okay, and then Christina would like to know, um, how do you prevent cross-contamination by cross-pollinization between your plots of different origins and by seed banking emerg seed bank emerging plants from previous years? Yeah, another good question. Um, so the first question, it, it, it kind of goes to my second or third slide there where I talked about field placement uh, with that, where we're uh, uh, maintaining a minimum distances uh, between that. Um, one of the things that we do though between crops in between times is we generally try to plant um, a forb over a grass and a grass over a forb and that allows us to basically um, take out the, the forbs that might be coming up um, from the crop before or a grass depending upon, um, you know, we use a uh, grass specific or forb specific herbicides to take, take the, the plot, the material out that's coming through. Great, and then one last question, um, and we'll also have more time at the end for the panel to answer questions. But Asia would like to know, do you keep seed on hand from those projects that give you seed? Yeah, we do. Uh, whenever we're allowed to, uh, that's actually a big source of, of how we get new ecotypes going at Hedgerow Farms. Um, when clients allow us to uh, keep the material, uh, we will usually keep it in and continue to grow that out. So that's a lot of the stuff that we have here came from that. Um, there are certain clients like uh, the National Park Service, for example, that uh, we can't continue that on. Uh, the, that seed is considered part of the public trust. So uh, we're sort of, we have to plow those crops under uh, in that particular situation. But 
In other cases, we can and do uh, maintain that material and continue to produce it. Okay, we're gonna move on to our next speaker now. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, I wanna thank everybody for listening to my talk today. My name is Dan Shryock and I've been an ecologist with the USGS Western Ecological Research Center for about nine years now. I work under Todd Eskew and Leslie DeFalco. Um, next slide, please. So much of my work is focused on our native plant genetics program and arose in part due to the National Seed Strategy, which recommended a series of actions to improve restoration outcomes across the US. So two of the key goals that this um, strategy recommended were to provide genetically appropriate seed and to develop tools that enable managers to make informed seeding decisions. So our program has largely focused on advancing these goals within the Mojave Desert, which as we can see from the map on the right is actually one of the larger floristic provinces in California. And so my goal today is just to try to give an overview of how we use landscape genomics for native plant restoration in the Mojave. And we'll use the most recent species we've genotyped as a case study. Next slide. But first, um, before I dive into the genomics, I wanna take a moment to discuss the Mojave because I don't think anybody's talked about that yet today. And it, it really, the region really epitomizes a lot of the different challenges in native plant restoration. So the Mojave's home, of course, to the federally threatened desert tortoise, which does afford protection to critical habitat areas but the Mojave has also been a nexus for utility scale renewable energy development. And at the same time, uh, invasive species, especially red brome, have increased the frequency of wildfires and desert vegetation is very slow to recover um, from fire because it's not a natural um, thing in the desert. So when we, and then when we do, Oh, let's see, like my slide changed there. So when we do try to reseed these areas, rodents in the Mojave, rodents and ants can remove large quantities of seed or we may not get enough precipitation for growth. Um, there's also been some evidence that increased temperature extremes are impacting desert species. So what all this together means is that, is that there's really a very narrow win window for successful native plant restoration in the Mojave. And so we need to try to control as many factors as we can to be successful. Next slide. Now, one of the factors that we can control is how we select and introduce native seeds during restoration. And in particular, we can try to account for local adaptation so the seeds we plant can withstand at least the natural pressures at a restoration site. A recent review of genetic studies in US deserts found that 70% of the studied population showed a home site advantage and 80% showed a signal of adaptation to local climate. Now this is a little bit higher than reviews on plants, plant species as a whole. But what I really wanna point out is that the most frequently implicated trait in the study um, was survival. So this does have clear implications for seed transfer in deserts. If we plant seeds that are maladapted to the local environment, they may not germinate or survive long enough to realize any benefits from the restoration. Next slide, please. So to account for local adaptation, 
We need tools that assess how far seeds can be transferred from their local environment before the risk of maladaptation becomes too high. One of the primary tools we use is called a seed transfer zone. Now, seed zones designate areas within which seeds can be transferred with limited risk of maladaptation. What we're talking about is not transfer across geographic distances, but rather environmental distance. So how much of a change in environment can an ecotype sustain without losing fitness? Um, seed zones are usually based on genetic information, and this can be collected either through common garden experiments, or as we'll discuss today, landscape genomics. So on the left is, is an example of seed zones to be published for Nevada ephedra, where temperature and precipitation seasonality were two of the key variables shaping the boundaries between the zones. But I also want to note that seed zones can also be used for species that haven't been genotyped. In this case, we call them provisional seed zones. And these are usually based only on climate. And so that kind of serves as a proxy for local adaptation. And we do have provisional seed zones that we published for the desert Southwest. And you can find these at the link on the left, along with all of the species specific or empirical seed zones that we published through USGS. Um, I also wanna just add uh, that seed Seed zones are mostly used for widespread and common species, but not necessarily for the rare species that we'll be talking about in the other sessions, since those tend to be very restricted in their distributions already. Uh, next slide, please. So as I've said, we use landscape genomics to create seed transfer zones for specific species. And what this means in practice is that we investigate spatial patterns of genetic variation and how environmental features like climate and topography shape genetic divergence across the landscape. And I like to think of this in terms of three scales. Okay? At the individual scale, local adaptation is expressed as islands of elevated divergence in the genome. And these can vary in size depending on the strength of natural selection and the degree of linkage between genetic loci. So first, at the individual level, we try to identify islands of divergence. Then at the population scale, we consider the frequency at which divergence occurs at the same location in the genome of individuals from the same population. And finally, at the landscape scale, we can compare patterns of genomic divergence between populations to assess whether these patterns relate to environmental features on the landscape, such as precipitation and temperature. Next slide. So when we're doing for restoration, we're generally using reduced representation methods, not whole genome sequencing. And what this means is that we're fragmenting DNA at cut sites or loci. Some of these fall on selectively neutral regions, but others might fall on these islands of divergence. And these are the loci, the loci that could relate to local adaptation. So what we have to do is distinguish neutral loci from those that are potentially adaptive. And to do this, we use a method called genome scans. These can either detect loci that are more diverged than expected if they were neutral, or they can incorporate environmental information directly by scanning for associations between allele frequencies and environmental variables. So genome scans for associations tend to be the more powerful approach. And so that's the method I, I use most often for our genotyping studies. Next slide. Um, so far through the Mojave Desert Native Plant Program, we've genotyped three native Mojave Desert plants. Um, and these were all considered priority species for seed zone development. Our aim with these studies is to genotype from 40 to 60 populations. This is something that's actually only become possible over the last five to 10 years. Uh, in terms of time, we can go from sequencing to seed transfer zones in one to two years which makes this a little bit faster than a typical common garden experiment where we might grow out plants, especially shrubs for a longer time period than that. Next slide.
Next slide, please. Do you uh, see can, the slide? Can we go to the next slide? Yeah, it's on, on my end. It's okay, not... I have it now, thanks. Okay. Okay, so our, our most recent study focused on the desert plantain or Plantago ovata. This is an annual forb that's used as forage by the desert tortoise and other herbivores. Uh, overall, we genotyped more than 60 populations for the species and an analysis of the overall genetic structure um, which is shown in the map in the middle here, identified that there were five broad genetic groups um, that are delineated here by the different colors. So some of the groups appeared to be separated by topography. For example, the mountain regions um, surrounding Death Valley and the Mojave National Preserve both bisected distinct genetic groups, um, but some of the other groups were very broad. However, since our purpose is to understand stand local adaptation, um, we can't really rely on the overall genetic structure. And this is because local adaptation can often occur at a much finer scale than that. And it can even be independent of neutral genetic structure because populations can still locally adapt um, even when they're connected by gene flow and might appear in the same broad genetic cluster. So our study design um, is actually meant to include populations from a number of different source climates. And this allows us to compare allele frequencies and see if certain genotypes are favored in specific environments, which in turn could indicate local adaptation. Um, next slide, please. And this is our model after performing the genome scans for this species. Uh, we found that there were 184 loci that were potentially adaptive, and these were most strongly associated with summer maximum temperature and precipitation seasonality. And so at the top of the slide, we have response curves from our model of local adaptation. These essentially describe the nature of this, the association between allele frequencies in each variable. So taking precipitation seasonality as an example, we can see that there was a stark divide between high and low values. Uh, and in the Mojave Desert, this distinguishes areas with winter-dominated precipitation from those that receive um, more bimodal precipitation patterns. And so from these relationships, we can also generate a map. Um, this is shown at the bottom. This is a spatial interpolation of the same model where the different colors represent the predicted pattern of adaptive genetic variation on the landscape. Um, and there's a lot more detail in the, the paper that we recently published in Molecular Ecology. Uh, but the key takeaway I want you to remember from this is that two of the most important variables in our model, summer and winter temperature, both suggested that genotypes from warmer environments were adaptively diverged from genotypes from cooler environments, meaning they were locally adapted to different temperature regimes. Um, next slide, please. So from that model, we were able to delineate um, eight seed transfer zones for Plantago ovata. And these are shown on the map on the right. And I've symbolized these according to increasing summer temperature. So the blue colors indicate um, cooler areas and the reds indicate the hottest zones. And as we've seen, each zone represents an area within which seed can be transferred um, with limited risk of maladaptation. So if we collect seed from zone five, we also want to plant it in zone five so that it can tolerate the environmental conditions at the planting site. Next slide, please. Okay, this is my final slide. And the last point I want to leave you with is that seed zones don't just have to be static in the current time period. Since each zone represents a set of current climate conditions and their corresponding genotypes, we can actually take predictions from models of future climate and project how seed zones and genotypes would need to shift across the landscape to maintain the same conditions to which they're adapted. So if we look at climate models for the period between now and 2040, 
um, temperatures in the Mojave are predicted to increase by up to three degrees in some areas. This means that the warm adapted genotypes, um, which are in the warmer zones that we identified in our model, could experience a large increase in their preferred climate type over the next two decades. So in, in the figure on the right, um, the map on the top shows the seed transfer zones in the current climate, and the map on the bottom shows the same zones that are projected into future climate. And from this calculation, we found that the climate type occupied by genotypes from the warmest seed zone is likely to expand five times in area over the next couple of decades. So this means that those genotypes might already possess favorable adaptations to cope with increasing temperature that's occurring in cooler parts of the species range um, where they don't grow now. So by projecting our model of adaptation just a little bit into the future, we can potentially gain insights that help us prioritize um, how to perform seed collections now so we can generate a sustainable supply of future resilient seed that could be planted over a much broader area in the near future. Um, uh, next slide. So uh, thanks everybody for listening. And uh, I can take questions if there's any time left. So there's no time. We're going to take a quick break. There's time for um, questions at the end of the session. Um, so we're going to take a quick break. Uh, hopefully you can get away from your screens and walk around a little bit. And we'll be back here promptly at 2.19. OK. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you uh, for sticking around. And thanks for the invitation, CNPS, to uh, present here. Uh, Dan's presentation just before this one was so lovely and detailed uh, that I, I feel mine will be rather simplistic uh, in comparison. Uh, but I want to start by talking a little bit about uh, climate change. And just yesterday, I saw a talk by Jeff Barlow, who's a senior meteorologist for the National Weather Service. And he basically was talking about climate whiplash in California, uh, that being that we went from a four-year intensely hot drought that killed 127 million trees or 137 million trees, mostly indirectly, to uh, a very heavy precipitation year. And now it looks like we're going back into a drought year. Uh, at the same time uh, that we had a very unusual uh, lightning event that is a climate change related event because it was a series of hurricanes and tropical storms, three in fact, that came up the west coast. Uh, so they didn't come from our normal monsoonal pattern, they came from the Pacific Ocean. And the, the high level clouds were sheared off, uh, came over, uh, went all the way up to Washington State, uh, carrying a lot of moisture and a lot of lightning. Uh, and the superheated air down below it uh, essentially evaporated any rain that was coming with that to uh, and so we, we are facing increasing wildfires. Another person in the, in the conference yesterday was talking about a, a park replacing fire and pointed to Lava Beds National Monument that had 70% uh, of its land burned. So we have some urgency with regards to, it's not just the uh, ramping of temperature through time that is uh, coming, but increasing stochasticity with regards to weather events. And I'm greatly heartened by what I am hearing and learning here at this conference with regards to initiatives to understand uh, genetic structure of populations of different plants. Um, and I think that that's desperately needed by resource managers. So resource managers typically are not moving they don't care if the climate's moving to Vancouver Island or something, they're not. Uh, and so what I'm going to talk about today are three approaches where we're trying to support natural resource managers. And particularly with regards, oh, I'm not shifting my things, thank you. Uh, particularly with, with regards to um, 
the excuse me uh, with regards to forestry and in forestry as Jessica Wright pointed out this morning uh, seed transfers uh, have been going on for quite a while so uh, here I'll talk a little bit about climate definitions and then I'll give you three quick examples of things that uh, we're trying to advance. So let's go to the next slide, please. And so there's different ways that we can talk about uh, climate change relative to land management. There's uh, climate velocity, the distance and speed that a set of climate conditions will move under projected futures. Rain shifts, which are a biological analog to climate velocity. And then the place-based exposure I briefly mentioned, we'll uh, get into that and uh, looking at climate refugia. So uh, with that, I'll take the next slide. And uh, this is a website that lets you pick a, uh, a city and say, where is the arriving climate coming from and where might a climate go to? And so you can see for Reading that the prediction here is that the climate somewhere in northern uh, Baja, Mexico will be the climate that is in Reading today, uh, will arrive to uh, Reading today. So there's a, an example of a climate velocity. Next slide. And then here is, uh, you know, a species distribution model, in this case, Ponderosa pine. Uh, and, you know, we have from the herbarium consortium and California Gap and forest uh, plots and CNPS plots and rapid surveys, uh, many points. And we can use those to develop a, a correlated based uh, measure of the current and future uh, range of the species based on different environmental climatic conditions. And so under a hot and dry future, on the left, the, the green is the area that re, is retained, the, area, the red is the area that's lost, and the blue are areas that become climatically suitable. Doesn't mean that Ponderosa would establish in those areas, uh, but uh, that's many, many papers have been published using species distribution models of one type or another. And under a wetter future, there's more. Uh, it's okay, yeah, you can jump. Uh, so then uh, one of the tools that we're working on, we're doing this project with CAL FIRE, where they are reactivating a nursery here in Davis, the LA Moran Reforestation Center, with the intention of trying to supply conifer seedlings to the private lands. So of course, California is about 50% public land and 50% private land. And CAL FIRE, in addition to uh, doing yeoman's work, is trying to, uh, fighting fires, is trying to assist with some restoration thereafter. So this is a, a tool that will be coming online and it lets you pick a, a location. So I picked Yolo County here and the purple is, this is the area that has some similar uh, climatic condition uh, to the flats of Yolo County today. Next slide. But if we were looking into the future and we wanted to, we were doing some restoration in Yolo County uh, by 2040, the climate that Yolo County will have are the locations that are shown in green here on the left. And by 2070, the climate that Yolo County will have is shown uh, on the right-hand side. And so when we're thinking about restoration, uh, should we really be, I love the idea of uh, using a broad genetic mix of seeds from a local area for the local adaptation. But if your uh, species will live for 70 years, then is that really the, the best bet given what the future climatic conditions will be and uh, the adaptive capacity, the survival capacity of that species. Next slide. And indeed, if we go a little further along the, the pathway down to 2100, then under a hot and dry, here's where, uh, you know, here comes the climate for uh, Central Valley Central locations. The other piece of this tool, next slide, is that you could pick, you can pick a location and it's picking by uh, a seed zone uh, as the ones that uh, Jessica Wright mentioned before, and then it's breaking it into elevational uh, bands within that. And it allows you, the tool will allow you to pick the location that you are 
trying to restore or trying to do some work at, and to look at temperature by 500 foot elevation band within that seed zone. And so the, the pink and the green are historical uh, temperature values in this case for uh, the Yolo County area. Uh, and then the yellow, the tan, and the gray lines are indicating the increase in temperature uh, into the future uh, with the gray being at 2100 and uh, the yellow being uh, proximal mid-century and end-century for that location. And so being able to uh, approach this not only from the perspective of what's the potential range of a, a species or a genotype such as what Dan was describing, but to say, okay, here is where we are, here's where we're working, and what will the, you know, let's anticipate what the future climate's going to be here. What does that uh, add to our considerations of when we're looking at restoration? Next slide. So the second thing has to do with uh, the seed collection for conifers. And so uh, it turns out that you know, there's these large walk-in freezers that are located at various different locations. And that's and in them are thousands of plastic bags of seeds for ponderosa and Douglas fir and other coniferous tree species. And that's our restoration stock, right? So those things have been being moved around and whatever for uh, many years, but that's what we have. Next slide. And uh, if we think that uh, individuals or populations that are coming from uh, low elevation locations uh, that might be the ones that we want to plant in anticipation of our site condition, then we need to uh, get out there and start collecting those. Next slide. So for ponderosa pine, we can take uh, a map of the habitat types that ponderosa pine occurs in. And I'm just going to give you a little example from the Sierra of a triage tool that we've developed. Next slide where we can say, okay, based on the range of the species, here's a map that, of uh, conifer that might have that species in it. Okay, next slide. Uh, for this uh, uh, section of the Sierra National Forest. And then here's the level of current exposure uh, for the locations that might have ponderosa pine. Next slide. Um, there we go. Uh, and here's where, what happens to the level of climatic stress for those populations. Uh, so if we want seeds from the warmer areas, we maybe need to get into those red zones now and collect those seeds before they uh, disappear in fires or other things. Next slide. So we can take that map and we can drop it onto some other maps uh, to help guide see, uh, searchers who are looking for seeds. Next slide. by bringing on uh, the roads for those locations, buffering the roads that go through the different location, the, the different levels of exposure and that have the correct habitat types or vegetation types, next slide. And then bringing in aerial photography to ask the question, do we still even have a, a forest at that location because perhaps it's burned or not? One more slide on this one. And because so the yellow lines here are Forest Service roads, and we can see locations that might be good to go scout to see whether there are uh, cone crops in a given year uh, and try to get to those locations before they burn. Okay, one last concept. Next slide. So that was the middle one. And now climate shifts within protected networks. So we've just uh, finished a project for the Cal Fish and uh, for the U.S. Wildlife Refuge System where we looked at the refuges on this map. And we asked what happens to the climates within them. So if you're managing for species across a network of protected areas, next slide, then you may run into a series of different types of climate dynamics within the protected areas that you're working or the, or the restoration areas that you're working. And so here are the, the dots, the, the bubbles on the chart are different protected areas and in climate space. And the green is a climate space in current time. And that climate space at the top could uh, migrate somewhere outside of your network. So you no longer have that climate, or it might move to a different protected area, or it might move to multiple analogous areas. So multiple other refuges would be suitable as a potential uh, assisted migration location. 
Uh, they may, the climate may endure, particularly if it's a large area. Uh, maybe the Mojave is a good example. Uh, and climate hubs are where climates from multiple places converge on a particular uh, refuge or a particular protected area. And so this framework might be useful. One more slide uh, for uh, this framework may be useful in terms of just thinking about, well, if I'm in the Bay Area and I've got 15 different places that I'm looking at, uh, what are what are the what happens to the climates within my network? And is my network connected enough that the, the species, the gene, gene flow is going to happen by itself or not? And so thank you very much. Uh, I think I have a, a thank you slide. And that's it. Can you can you see me or can you um, hear me? This is Peggy. Yes, to both. Good. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you, and these are great talks. Um, I'm going to go over. You can. I. This is the beautiful um, BLM lands that was from the 2017 super bloom, and I just. Unfortunately, didn't get to get there, but I use the picture from one of our photographers all the time because it's just spectacular. Anyhow, I'm going to talk about the National Seed Strategy and Seeds of Success. And so I was glad that Dan mentioned the seed strategy. You can go to the next slide. Or am I changing the slides? Nope. Oops. So um, back in 2014, my uh, director of BLM asked me why he was hearing that native seed don't work in restoration after wildfires. And I said, because they're not using the appropriate locally adapted native seed. Um, we're getting stuff to use in the Great Basin that's coming from uh, Cal uh, Colorado, uh, not Colorado, uh, Canada and Montana. And that's what's available to us at this point. So that's why it's not working. So. He was very excited about getting us together with all the other land managing agencies and federal agencies. And so we started that uh, development. Can we go back to the last slide? I just wanna go through what those four goals are because I think, and I just wanna talk a little bit about them. So the first goal was to assess the national seed needs because as we have heard, uh, from the East Coast to the West Coast to the South, uh, we're, we're all getting uh, climate um, events and we're all having the need to get seed. Uh, so we are looking at the assess assessing at a national level, uh, the seed needs and the capacity to meet the goals for restoration. We're also working and I was glad that uh, Dan you know, the, the, the largest goal or the most expensive goal in our national seed strategy is the research. So goal number two, conduct research to provide genetically appropriate seed reserves and improve seed production. So there is a lot that we need to be doing in that goal to get the right stuff out there on the ground. The third one is developing the tools to enable the ecological restoration to be conducted by the land managers. And then the fourth is communicating an outreach of that to um, the staff at the 12 federal agencies and all of our partners throughout the Plant Conservation Alliance and other stakeholders. You can go to the next slide. The highest priority uh, action that was uh, discussed at the time that we were developing the seed strategy was the national assessment. So in 2019, BLM and others um, worked with the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine to um, 
contract with them to do an independent, unbiased study on this. And they're gonna identify steps to improve deficiencies in the number and diversity of native species commercially available, as well as a few other things. But what I really wanted to get at here is that they, are, they have just finished phase one and they are providing that report to us and to Congress and the public. It'll be available to the public at this um, uh, website that's at the bottom of this page. And we'll, make, we'll, we'll get that out there to everybody because phase one is just the beginning of this. So they have developed a study group. It's headed by uh, Dr. Susan Harrison out of UC Davis. And um, those folks have finished phase one, which is, is sort of figuring out what the issue is and what the supply chain looks like now and how we can make it better. Um, once I want to make sure that California gets engaged with us on phase two of it, which is really the assessment, and, it, and they will be sending out a survey for folks to see what the needs are in you know, your area, in your land that you're managing, that you want to restore, and what the capacity is. Um, next slide, please. One of the other things that just came out, and I just want to um, make sure everybody's aware of it, are the international standards for native seed and ecological restoration. This is an o, a special issue of Society for Ecological Restoration, and it's totally focused on native seeds and ecological restoration, and it's open access. And we will give you the link. I thought the link was on this slide, but I don't see it, so I'm not exactly sure whether my screen is just not working as well. Hopefully you can get to it. If you can't, you can go on to www.blm.gov slash seed strategy. And I think we have a link for it in there. Open access, everybody can have it. Um, go ahead to the next one. I just want to go through what we view as our native plant materials development cycle uh, in the federal agencies and how we're working on it. And um, it's a six step process and, and we're working at various stages. It's different for every species that we're working with. Um, but as you can see, steps two, three, four, even five and six, those are all fairly research related and um, uh, we're doing a lot with our partners. We're not doing it all. The, um, we can go to the next slide. I'm gonna focus here on the seed, native seed collection, step one in our process to give you some ideas. So the mission of Seeds of Success is to collect wildland native seed for research, development, ecosystem restoration and germplasm conservation. And we started this program in 20, uh, 2001. And um, so we've been at it now 20 years of collection. You can go to the next slide. What I wanna show here is, is California was the third state to join in with this. And I don't mean the state of California, but where we were collecting. So this is from 2001 through uh, to currently. I mean, we're still collecting out there in California today, but we've made over 25,000 collections. Uh, and you can go to the next slide. In California alone, we've made over 3,910 and we're, this is up through 2019 numbers. We've got 922 unique taxa, 430 different genera, 90 different families, 15 different ecoregions. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, of those genera, the top 10, we've got three grasses, three shrubs, and four forbs. Go ahead to the next one. 
where those collections have happened. BLM has a large tracts of land in the Mojave, Central California foothills. So you sort of see uh, by level three eco region. Go ahead to the next. So I just want to talk a little bit here about a procurement tool that we have put together in BLM uh, to work with our seed warehouse system and work with growers. So in 2018, we put out um, a, a request for bids on, 40, on 41 grasses and 70 forbs um, that were are requested by state and eco regions. So we're looking to use the provisional seed transfer zones in this. This is the um, contracting process. And you can see we started with $2.5 million on this. And the important part of this is that we're viewing this as a checking account. And right now our, our um, working capital fund, as we call it, is at $10 million. And it's a way for us to take the risk out of the growers and the government is taking that risk. What's, what's happening is we've got, we've got um, let's say this year we're doing, I think 10 different contracts uh, worth about $3 million to $4 million. Uh, the growers will grow that material out. They'll put it back into our seed warehouse, the National Seed Warehouse System. And then our seed warehouse will sell that material to various restoration projects. And it can be any of the BLM field offices that could buy it. It could be, an, it could be the state of California that buys it. It could be the, um, a tribe, uh, any number of entities. I think we, out of our seed warehouse, sell to 40 different entities at this point. The really uh, important feature here is that that money that the seed warehouse sells that that material that's those seeds for goes back into the working capital fund. And so we are able then to do species X, Y, and Z from eco region five, six, and seven next year. And then that process will happen over and over again. And I'm, I'm hoping that we can build this system up to $20 million because if we're spending somewhere around $3 million every year and it might take two to three years to get that material into the system and then sold back out to a restoration project that will have more funds in there to continue that. Um, next slide. And this is the number of Seeds of Success collection, oops, collections that were of the IDIQ that are on this procurement tool. Um, so 85 unique taxa have been collected that are on that. Um, you can sort of see there's the top 10. Uh, let's go to the next slide because I think I only have another, a minute or two. And I just wanted to talk about uh, next steps. I think uh, it would be great if California was to develop a step down seed strategy for California the way that um, Nevada has done. And I would encourage California to work with us to make operational co collections for the growers like Hedgerow to have. Thanks. Thanks, Peggy. Before I open it back up to the full panel, um, there's a question for you about um, how is the National Academy determining the recipients of the survey in regards to the native seed needs and restoration. So that survey that you mentioned, I think a lot of us are interested. Yeah, and I think that's why I wanted to make sure that the, um, the email, we'll get you the, e I mean, not the email, Dr. Robin Shane, S-C-H-O-E-N is leading that um, study for the, um, and just get in touch with me, Anna Lindquist or um, Christina, and we will get you her information. Uh, but I think you can go up onto the National Academies of Sciences website and they will have, if you just put in national uh, seed assessment, I think you can find it just going onto there and it'll have a whole, um, if you wanna get 
mail emails about it, you can sign up on the National Academies of Sciences. And I know that uh, uh, phase one reports going to be coming to BLM probably in the next week or so. Oh, there, Anna just sent it out to everybody. The, the link it's on, it's in the chat. Great. Thank you, Anna. Thanks, Anna. Um, so I'm going to invite the other panelists to unmute. And we have a few questions to answer in the last 15 minutes before we take another break. Um, Peggy, while you're still uh, on the mic, there's a question from Andy. The current published national seed strategy period is 2015 to 2020. Will there be an update and renewal of the national seed strategy? Oh, I forgot to say that. Yes, there will be. We're going to do version 2.0. So if folks want to get engaged with us to do that, it, we're just now working on a progress report. Um, my understanding from uh, Molly McCormick at USGS, who's pulling it all together, is that we had 500 projects that um, came in from the federal agencies uh, that are showcasing their the implementation of the seed strategy 2015 to 2020. But version 2.0, we're going to be in the process of um, of working on that in the next six months. Great. And a question for the panel from Stephanie that I think Pat um, would like to jump in and answer about um, whether California has yellow tag source identified certification available through the California Crop Improvement Association. Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, CCIA, um, uh, it, it, start, it start, restarted the native seed program that it had going here about 15 years ago, just a couple of years ago. And um, yeah, it, so now you have the ability to get seed certified. And uh, Hedgerow Farms, we were the first folks to get certified. They're called yellow tags. Uh, it's a process where uh, the wildland seed locations, uh, where the wildland seed locations are documented. Uh, someone comes out to the field. Um, uh, to, to document growing and then they evaluate the seed tests at the end. So it's a good program. Uh, we're trying to get um, all of our new seed that starts uh, into the certification program, but it's, it's all stuff that's from the beginning. And so it, it has to be the, the new starts. You can't grandfather in anything else. So there's not too many things yet that are yellow tag, but um, hopefully we'll get a lot more moving forward. Great. And does anybody want anybody else want to jump in and talk about the advantages and disadvantages as seen by various stakeholder groups of a yellow tag certification for seed lots if it's useful for native plant seed versus um, versus quote unquote regular crops? Uh, and without, a, without a yellow tag program, how do projects that require seed lots of a specific ecotype verify that? I, I can talk about that real briefly. Um, yeah, no, I think there are advantages to um, uh, getting yellow tags. Uh, it's a it's a formal documentation of the material having been collected from the wild and grown out and evaluated. So I think there is some advantages to that. Certainly, um, I think in the absence of a of the yellow tags, that there really isn't um, you know a formal documentation of the of how the seed was collected and produced. So um, it's it's kind of a trust the grower. I think. Um, but I think, yeah, I think I, I, I think it's a great, great thing that's uh, started up again. And I and hopefully we get a lot more yellow tags going in the future. I would say uh, this is Peggy. I would say that uh, BLM will only buy certified seeds. So, um, you know, we we are definitely um, in favor of, of, of having this and and we're working to get some of our larger collections certified so we go out and do these seeds of success collections some of them are just your standard we need to get this into germplasm um, seed banking but then some we're doing for research and others we're doing for operational so that we can give them to the growers to grow and um, we've been taking up in Oregon they've agreed the seeds the state seed certification folks are using our SO, because we're using SOS protocol and we collect so much information about the collection during that process, they're using our collection information and data as certifi certification for the seed. So I don't know if other states will do that, but at least we're having that happening 
in um, Oregon so that then it doesn't have to get recertified. Okay, um, another question. Uh, are provisional seed zones available or in development for other parts of the California Floristic Province? And I think this was a, a question either directed at, at Dan or Jim. Um, we're not currently developing seed zones for the other California uh, provinces. We uh, work exclusively with the Mojave. Dan, that's such great work, uh, really cool. Um, I would love to see that kind of work happening, uh, particularly for species that are distributed across uh, the rest of California, maybe the coast ranges or something. So some of the other talks that we've seen, there's been, you know, there might be an opportunity to do something like that, but, you know, we, we need it. The, the Forest Service is basically using these, these blobs on maps that are not related to plant genetics other than you know, sort of the the uh, uh, thumb thumb guidelines of keep it keep it as local as possible within a hundred miles and five hundred feet or something, right? And so, you know, we've broken it down to look at the analogous climates uh, in those with regards to those because that's what the current uh, inventory is registered to for the for conifer seeds. So the current inventory is registered to township section and range seed zone. Maybe you get an elevation. That's all you got. But we've got thousands of, of collections that have that. So we want to, uh, as we move to better precision and to bringing in genetic data uh, to help to inform seed zones, we still need to entrain the old information along with that. Great. So the next question is, is a very meaty one from Christina. Um, evolutionary studies like the ones presented in the morning alert us of the importance of preserving local genetic variation by not introducing anthropogenic gene flow. Yet ecological restoration talks focus on a much larger spatial scale, potentially swamping local genetic variation. Do we have a conflict between ecological restoration and conservation of biodiversity? And is ecological restoration worth the impact, the potential impact it causes to native populations? That's a, that's a biggie. Um, yeah. It's kind of the point of the symposium uh, right there. Yeah. Um, I'd like to offer a few thoughts that aren't particularly well developed. Um, one is to think about, is to always remember the power of natural selection to winnow out maladaptive genotypes. So if we're looking at adaptive genetic variation, then um, I personally have some faith that if you put in a wide enough uh, you know, genotype variability that um, it will get selected down to appropriate uh, local adaptations. Um, on the other hand, there's the neutral genetic variation that we do so much of our phylogeny and, and things with that, that um, you know, because they're neutral, they're just going to get into the populations and kind of muck up what we can find out about the uh, phylogenetic history. So, but I tend to come down as I'd rather have a functioning ecosystem than, um, especially with really broadly distributed species, I'd rather have a functional ecosystem than preserving uh, this signal of neutral genetic variability. Yeah, I think, uh, I, go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say, I think we can also draw a contrast between the types of uh, tools that we want to use um, for, you know, species that are more rare and already have a limited distribution compared to um, species that are very widespread. Um, we use the large scale seed transfer zones for species that already have large distributions. Um, and we wouldn't really recommend it. We're conserving the genetic diversity of a very limited species um, is a more is more important. So, I think the nature of the species plays 
into it a lot. And the other thing is they, we also try to tailor the tools to um, the reality of seed production. Because if, if we make this, if we define seed zones uh, extremely narrow, that might um, make it very difficult for you know, the growers to actually produce the seeds for each zone. So we, we also want them to be a useful management tool and work on, on a scale that um, allows us to work with seed producers so that they can actually produce seed to make it available for the different zones. Uh, I'll jump in with uh, two comments. I, I think it's very similar to the question that uh, a land manager faces of, am I gonna try to resist climate change or am I gonna go with it if, if my, I think where I am is gonna convert to a different vegetation type? Right, and so if we think an area is going to convert, you know, that, and that's the money decision, and this is a money decision as well. It's like, well, we have a, a certain amount of capacity to deal with things, and so what's going to be the the best bet in different places? Uh, and then with the with these uh, analogous climate seed zones with uh, and anticipating warming, the idea there was, say, you were at at a two thousand feet in the Sierra, and you wanted to replant a ponderosa pine stand. Maybe you would try to get stuff from lower elevation but so that by the time those trees are mature and they're reproducing, they're in the climate that they came from, they're, they're, uh, they were produced in originally. And if that's the case, we may be looking at doing that more than once. We may be looking at over a century, we might have to be hopscotching up the side of the mountain if that's a, if that's a strategy that works, right? It may not work, but, but you know, if that's if that's a strategy, you do it once, and then you might be by the time those trees are growing up. Now the climate's going to be another 400 feet or 4,000 feet higher, and you have to jump up again. Great, and one last question or comment from um, Kevin Rice. Uh, Peggy, great to see this is happening. Is anyone checking on whether unconscious selection might be happening during storage? For example, some genotypes may have reduced viability under storage. So a good question. Thanks, Kevin. Um, we're just, I forgot to mention this one. We're just working uh, with Chris, Dr. Chris Walters from uh, ARS up in Fort Collins, and she's going to be looking at uh, seed longevity in our seeds of success collections, because ultimately, even though we have larger collections than, than the seed banking. Every one of the SOS collections has at least the seed banking aspect of it, which ultimately gets the material for long-term storage up to uh, Chris Walter's lab in uh, Fort Collins at ARS. And she and others have a, a new way of testing viability, looking at the gases that are, are that come off of the seed so that they're not having to destroy the seed. So we just put in a, a funding for her to do that um, where she'll get new seed of the same species and then use um, some of the stuff that's in storage because it can take a year to get our seed from the collection point into the um, long-term seed storage up at Fort Collins. So thanks. And if you want to talk to, to uh, Chris Walters about it, uh, we just started it. So we're not, we don't have any data or anything else. So 